Okay, good morning slash good afternoon slash good Thursday, everyone, wherever you're at. Super happy to have you with us this morning. I am launching yet another panel session hosted by Privado. We have some amazing panelists with us this morning. I will let them go around the table and introduce themselves. Mira, in my order, I'll let you go first. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mira. I'm a privacy architect at Uber. Um, I work with a variety of stakeholders, uh, mitigating risk and, and driving privacy forward across across the business at Uber, from building data governance frameworks to partnering with engineers, um, to working with our subsidiaries and building data migration programs, to working with our own privacy engineers who build our privacy tools. Um, so I... I sit on that side of, of privacy engineering. Thank you, Mira. Good to know you. And Mira is a great friend and a former colleague of mine. So very, very happy to have you here. From Mira to another close friend, somebody else I've admired for a long time, learned a ton from. Pramod, introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Nishan. Hey, everyone. My name is Pramod Raghavendra. I'm super excited to be here. I currently lead Coinbase's uh, privacy function um, and, and also am responsible for data protection and third-party security there. Um, uh, before here, I'd worked at Google and Amazon uh, again, working on privacy and security considerations. Uh, an interesting fact about myself, my uh, my introduction to privacy was complete happenstance, where I got an opportunity to work with Amazon when I was living in Australia. And I basically shifted hemispheres to come and take on this role in privacy, which have then made my career. So looking forward to the conversation with, with, uh, with everyone on the panel here today. Thank you, Pramod. I will have Aaron go next. Thanks, Lashar. Uh, my name is Aaron Weller. I joined HP last year to set up a global privacy engineering center of excellence that I run. Uh, so my role is pretty broad across the whole of HP globally, uh, really looking for how do we uh, understand and enable uh, our tens of thousands of software engineers to, uh, to build privacy into everything they do. Thank you, Aaron. And we just had Ellen join us. So Ellen, we're doing introductions right now. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Nadeau. I'm engineering manager for privacy engineering and data protection team at Cruise. I've been here almost four years now. Cruise is a self-driving car company. We have a ride hail service, and we also do self-driving deliveries for partner companies. Thank you. And I'll just briefly introduce myself. As, as I mentioned before, my name is Nishant Bajaria. I have led privacy engineering teams at Google, Uber, and Meta. And I've also written a book on the topic, so that's enough about me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Devesh, and I'll just kind of run around the panel. You know, privacy engineering as a discipline has come around for a long time. It is still fairly new. So I want to put it to our question, our, our panelists. What does privacy engineering mean to you, either in terms of definitions, but hopefully practically speaking in terms of the function you serve in your company? What does privacy engineering mean? What problem are you solving? What gets done better because of you? Mira first. Uh, my scope of work, it's really identifying and solving for privacy risk, mitigating that risk for the business. Awesome. And just to follow up a little bit, like what is your actual contribution? Like there are different kinds of privacy engineers. Can you give our, our audience an example of what you do? Absolutely. As an architect, um, I don't code. Um, I'm not building the tools, but I am working with uh, legal stakeholders, engineering stakeholders, um, internal and external, uh, externally facing to uh, understand legal uh, legal risk, compliance, um, requirements, internal policies, and ensure alignment with our, our tools that we're building, um, understanding where privacy gaps exist as our engineers are building new features and products throughout the business, working with them to drive privacy forward um, from uh, engineering really privacy into design. So um, a, a phrase I picked up from you years ago was uh, serving as the connective tissue um, between that legal compliance and um, the engineering technical technical impl um, uh, implementation of of legal compliance. And Mira does an excellent job of that, Sumira. Thank you so much. Pramod, your interpretation of the role and value proposition for it? Yeah, I think privacy engineering has become uh, an overloaded term can mean a variety of things on the spectrum, right? On one end is people that work with other engineering teams and product teams and provide uh, advisory services from a privacy standpoint. The other end of the spectrum is where you actually have software engineers building solutions that, that forward privacy along. And de depending on the organization, the culture, the type of the role, anywhere along that spectrum, you could have people operating. 
I started my career uh, on the on the first end of the spectrum that I spoke about, where reactively providing advisory services uh, to a lot of product and engineering teams, and then uh, over over the time that I've spent, have have built cross functional teams that kind of cover the entire spectrum to be able to provide a full service uh, privacy capability in an enterprise. And Brahma, just a quick follow up: Does it vary based on the type of company, the company's life cycle, the privacy posture of the company? What variations have you seen in terms of how companies expect you to deliver value? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think depending on what the companies think about privacy, there are some that think about privacy as a compliance checkbox. In that instance, you'll see a lot of people that sit on the advisory side of things. Um, I, I need to provide advice. I need to go and make sure I check a few boxes, run a few DPIAs, uh, extract the ROPA, and uh, done. Whereas other uh, companies think about privacy more through the lens of customer trust, or uh, even 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 better as a product differentiator. And that's when you start to see the shift on that spectrum to the other end, where you're getting more proactive in your approach, uh, investing in technology, uh, building engineering solutions that allow you to scale privacy overall. Uh, the stage of the company also matters uh, and the type of the company or the domain that you operate in. If you operate in the health space or if you operate in the child product space, privacy kind of is an inherent part of what you're building. But uh, but with many other businesses, you typically start with the compliance lens and then perhaps transition into some of the more uh, mature aspects of privacy along that spectrum. And that's a fantastic one. I hope people listening pick that up because you have to start somewhere. Too many privacy security specialists are either compliance only or they blanch at the idea of compliance. So, But to Pramod's point, using it as a baseline foundation is a great place to start. So thank you, Pramod. Aaron, over to you. Love the fact that you we have such a big privacy engineering investment coming from HP. So it's not traditionally a company I've talked about a lot in terms of privacy. So you've done an amazing job of building it out there. So love to get, get your sense of what that discipline means in HP right now and for you personally. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think similar to some of the other folks here. Uh, for me, there's uh, there's a little bit of reactive and there's a little bit of proactive. There's a bit of uh, what can we do today with the things that we're building to really help build privacy into the way that people think about not just the uh, the code, but also the user experience. So that's one of the things that I'm passionate about is saying that, you know, to me, you have to engineer or architect the privacy experience, which I think promote goes to what you were saying about trust as well. It's kind of how are you going to trust us if you have various little bits of experience that don't kind of match up into one overall thing? But the other piece that's really important, kind of where my uh, the privacy architect side of my team uh, is really looking is kind of where is the ball going to go in the future? So how do we build out the tools and the uh, the systems that are going to allow us to be to be compliant with laws that don't even exist yet? And to build kind of that flexible structure that we can manage risks and not have to run around like we did with GDPR, or a lot of us did with GDPR, um, and spend years trying to actually get this uh, uh, to, to get this thing built, but to build a flexible uh, kind of engineering platform that will allow us to adapt as the business changes and the external environment changes too. That is terrific. Ellen, over to you. Yeah, well, I think some of what everyone said has definitely resonates with the approach we're taking at Cruise. I think um, some of Pramod's comments about um, the two different kind of arms of privacy uh, really align with our approach. So I'd say that uh, we certainly see privacy as a product feature and are working toward that. So building trust, not only with our customers, but internally with our employees and contractors in regards to how we're handling their data as well. Um, so we have two sub teams, privacy engineering services, that is that more consultative arm, reviewing new features, new data processing, new applications, delivering requirements, developing the playbooks for new markets, right? The proactive guidance and standards. And then we have privacy infrastructure, and that's the team of security software engineers that's building out tooling and platforms to help us achieve our objectives. And I feel like bringing that in-house within privacy engineering team gives us a lot more autonomy in actually driving forward the work of data discovery, data tagging, and helps us um, really do technical enforcement of the policies that we're collaboratively developing with privacy legal as well. That is great. And I'll kind of swap the order a little bit. I'll ask Ellen the next question. So she gets a chance to sort of speak first. I think one of the challenges when it comes to privacy engineering is proving the value proposition. And it's a bit like, how do you make the case that something would have been worse if not for you? And privacy engineering is about fixing legacy issues, but also starting things correctly from the get-go. So, Ellen, how have you built techniques and communication methodologies and metrics to make the case that what you're doing is actually working and that results are actually showing up? Because it's hard to some blame, blame engineering for stuff, because if not for the engineering and innovators, you and I wouldn't have a job. So how do you 
before yeah. the metrics go up? How do you make the case that what you're doing is working? Yeah, it's a great point. And so there is the, in some ways, the compliance piece is the easiest because there are clearer um, like financial and reputational implications if you're not able to achieve those, right? I think in terms of more broadly thinking about privacy as a product feature, what I'd encourage folks to do is to um, take a look at if you have like a research team at your company that's actually conducting research with customers, um, are you able to work with them to include questions that specifically give you data about how your customers see privacy related topics, right? Are there things that you can then pull into your work to say, hey, our customers want to see X, Y, Z. Relatedly, if your marketing team has certain messages that you see a direct tie to the work you're doing on privacy, that's a good partner to have as well. Like, There's a reason why they're using that in their marketing, right? Um, there's something they've seen in customers that makes them want to highlight that aspect of things. So, so I'd say really think about, um, you know, outside of the very important compliance obligations, um, yeah, how can you ensure that um, you're demonstrating that customers want this level of trust with your company and the products and services that you're offering. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Aaron, how have you demonstrated value, like especially to your internal stakeholders who may be a little skeptical to start with? Yeah, I think maybe something a little bit different from uh, from what Ellen was saying. But one of the ways we're looking at is how do you get more value out of existing data sets, right? So we've collected a lot of data over the years. Some of it we have constraints on how we can use it, right? There may be a legal constraint. There may be some uh, some other constraints. And being able to use privacy enhancing technologies and other ways of transforming that data where we're not breaking the original data set, but we're saying, hey, if you use this version of it, we can actually do more with the data you've already got, right? That That's a way that we can able to show value. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is almost like a, a seed funding approach where if we find part of the business where we've got a, they've got a specific problem, it's getting seed funding to work on their problem and then being able to scale that platform or whatever we build to solve for other problems that are similar nature in other teams. So if you contribute in, then you're going to get the benefit from everybody else's contributions as well. So that's one way that we've been able to kind of show directly to a specific team, we can work on a use case that works for you, but then bring that back and be able to scale that uh, to the larger organization. And I think that's an excellent point, Aaron. It's a bit like life insurance. It's making sure, like, probably shouldn't use life insurance as an example, but it's like medical insurance. You put pay into a system and you may not immediately see the benefit, but you keep the system holds within one day, someday you'll benefit too. So it's, it's a way to bring the community a little bit together. It, exactly. And I think it's good as well because it means that you can actually get uh, some advocates where they can say, yeah, they solved this problem for me. Whereas I think sometimes if we try and go too big, it's people are like, well, that exists, but how does it, you know, what have you done for me lately? Absolutely. Great point. From on the over to you. I think especially I want to hear from you. How do you make an argument like this at a really large company where people don't always know what's happening elsewhere? Yeah, I think for me, privacy has always been about customer trust, right? So um, I've taken a customer centric approach to this. And one way that has worked for me is uh, creation of a persona that is specific to the privacy scenarios. So uh, I, I used to call it reasonable customer, uh, which is kind of an average of uh, the entire spectrum of customers that you'll find who have a little bit of understanding of privacy, but but have uh, but take pride in terms of uh, their data, their protection, their safety, etc. Once you start to define that persona, that persona becomes ingrained in every product conversation. Right? You're, you're always thinking about your product from a perspective of that persona, not just your revenue bringing persona. Uh, I think that that helps ingrain privacy uh, within an enterprise. Uh, that's kind of the carrot approach. The, the, the stick approach is uh, with any product launch, think about what a Wall Street Journal front page headline in a negative sense could be uh, as a result of what you're launching. And, and that tends to uh, typically open eyes to people that may not be thinking about privacy uh, or maybe thinking about privacy as a cost and a blocker rather than an investment um, and, and an upfront uh, exercise. So I think these two tools have, have worked really well in the past to start to highlight the value that privacy brings to the table. Well, just to push a little bit on that, what if you face resistance internally and people say, oh, it won't happen to us. There's always a human belief that something bad is going to happen to somebody else who's like less careful than you are. So how do you shake people off their complacency a little bit there? Yeah, I think there's 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 two parts to that, right? The first is a lot of groundwork in terms of education, building a privacy-centric culture is required, uh, which includes uh, getting your top management in line, uh, building privacy principles, et cetera, that's, that start to make point-in-time conversations a lot more easier to have. 
But in a point in time conversation, if there is pushback or or uh, or comfort in terms of launching what was originally intended, even if not uh, taking care of all the privacy considerations, I think there's the, the the important thing to do is to identify a clear risk owner, because there is risk being taken. Identify that that ownership uh, and start to establish accountability there. Right. I think uh, typically when when people are accountable for something, they tend to think about things very, very differently. So if, if, if the person you're speaking to is not the person that's uh, owning the risk, then it's the wrong stakeholder to be engaging with. So identify who that risk owner is, bring it to their attention and say, yes, if you if you choose to go down this path, you're you're OK to go down that path as long as you can acknowledge these risks that you're taking on. So I think I've seen that uh, accountability shift. Uh, privacy is not owned by the team that sits in the corner and is called the privacy team, right? So identifying who that right owner is is going to be super critical in those instances. That's a great point. So again, please don't think of yourself as a, as a central team that's either a martyr or the master. Like your job is to be collaborators, consultants, facilitators. So promote the excellent point again. Mira, over to you. Your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, building on um, Promote's point, I think the road of of diplomacy and that relationship building is absolutely paramount. We have to gain the trust of our stakeholders throughout the business um, and really understand you know, their mission, what they're building, um, understand their why um, in order for us to sell the importance of privacy and get their buy-in. Um, we're absolutely dependent on that um, versus being seen as the obstacle, which is you know often the case when, when teams hear legal or compliance, they hear blocker. Um, so if we can instead be an ally uh, and and gain their buy-in, then it's just going to be an easier process throughout. Similarly, um, with the tools that we're building, um, building for ease, building for automation, building tools that take work away from um, the engineers rather than giving them more work to do. We're actually making it easier for them to implement uh, privacy. Um, we're enabling privacy for the business. We're facilitating business as we're, we're building for privacy by, by building tools that, that cater to that. And this is a great point. So again, for the audience, Pramod, towards the closing point of his statement, said that this is not just a central team kind of sitting in the corner. And, and to Mira's point, you want to make sure that the privacy team is seen as doing something for the engineers and making it better for them. So that could mean building something for privacy and repurposing it for a different purpose or coming up with more uses for an existing privacy solution. So Mira, do you have an example of something that we could build initially with the privacy view in mind, but could be used for something totally different? Anything come to mind there? Um, I think, you know, deletion is a, is a, a, something that's a thorn in everybody's side and, and how do we integrate, um, you know, data sets with deletion tools. So if we're building a deletion system, um, that will will be a, a checkbox. It's a, a quick onboarding um, experience for the engineers versus you have to implement this API and it's going to be three work, weeks of work for your engineering team and you have to go do this. Uh, that's a very different message and it will be received very differently. And Mira makes a great point. I think a part of the difficulty is sometimes you take on such a rush mentality to this job that you fix a problem and you move on. But I think someone as skilled as Mira will tell you that when you invest in the company's resources, it is in your interest to deliver as much value as possible. So there is an efficiency argument to be made as well. Uh, by the way, I'm also getting a lot of questions on Slack and the webinar chat. So if you see me typing, that's kind of what I'm doing. So keep the questions coming in and I'll kind of weave them in as much as I can. Uh, Pramod, we'd love to hear from you an example of something that was built initially for a privacy use case and repurposed for a broader or the other way around where something that was built for a totally different use case and you were able to find pri privacy muscle in it. So any examples? Yeah, I think uh, tokenization stands out as an example. Tokenization is a well understood design pattern uh, to, to kind of share data, reduce its, its risk overall from a security standpoint. But when you start to combine tokenization and pseudonymization, you, you can start to get huge amounts of uh, gains from a privacy standpoint as well. But typically, tokenization systems have one central authority which, which maintains mappings, and then you kind of federate uh, identity across the, the enterprise based on that. Uh, now, if you start to fortify these, these tokenization systems, bring in uh, unidirectional transformations to, to achieve pseudonymization, for example, hashing as an, as an approach, um, or, or even uh, encryption with, with really protected keys, uh, you can start to really uh, build on top of your existing frameworks without adding too much overhead and achieving a lot of significant privacy outcomes. 
So uh, I've, I've always uh, wanted to leverage what's existing without needing to build new things unless you absolutely have to. Uh, tokenization stands out as one of those things. Great point, Pramod. And I think the other benefit of what Pramod is mentioning is that when you demonstrate that tools can be repurposed, it makes the argument that you should be more collaborative while building it. So as a privacy engineer, you are making people come out of their silos. It doesn't have to be just privacy and GDPR alarm bells that should bring people together. You can proactively innovate and work together as a team. And I think as privacy engineers, it's our job to set that example, partly because our life and our paycheck depends upon it, because we cannot work in silos. But second, there is a chance to sort of set that positive example for the company as a whole. And an example that you might have, I'm sure you have a few that talk, you can talk about. Yeah, one that's interesting because it's a little bit different uh, is touch governance. So thinking about how do we as a whole organization, uh, let's say my relationship between HP and Nishant, right? Lots of different parts of the organization. We all want to talk to you. We all want to sell stuff. How do we govern kind of all of those different touches? And when you dig into it, you've got to understand kind of the life cycle of consent. You know, what are we telling people up front? How do we kind of draw that thread through all of this experience? So uh, it was a project that I had uh, started looking at at one end, and then you can talk to the marketing team and they're looking at it from the other end. And we were able to kind of combine those efforts into how do we really think about the, the overall relationship we have with each of our customers and think about it in a way that protects privacy, is transparent, but it's also achieving those business objectives as well. So, you know, that there are some things that my team could add that uh, uh, we're looking at things in a different way from how the, uh, um, the marketing team was looking at it. That is terrific. And I'm sure you have a lot considering the kinds of companies you work for. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So a couple examples, uh, the team built uh, tooling for more robust data discovery in our major data stores and having a source of truth, like inventory of what personal data we have in our major data stores is of interest far beyond privacy, right? So that's something that we found extremely valuable for other teams as well. Um, team also built out tooling to enumerate what permissions look like across our major data stores. And so seeing who has a read access to a given project, of, of course, other security teams benefit for that, but also those who are actually leveraging those, those data sets are interested in what use looks like, right? The owners of those, those data sets. So um, that's been really valuable. Another that comes to mind is, is work the team has done around identifying what data is abandoned and then archiving that data. Um, of course, there are big cost savings there if you're able to um, you know, archive data Data that is no longer being actively used. So a lot of ways we've been able to um, to yeah help expand those tools for for other use cases. One example I'll, I'll share that uh, other tooling that we leverage a, a security team, a partner security team, developed uh, really great tooling around uh, detections and alerts to detect on anomalous activity in our systems, and that's been one that we've been able to really leverage on anomalous activity related to personal data. That is phenomenal. So. I mean, I, using sort of those examples in terms of the work itself, let's talk about the people doing the work, whether you have a central privacy team that builds stuff for people like we did at Uber back in the day, or whether you have a more federated model where a central team sort of tells other teams what to do. It is hard to always know what skills are available from a privacy perspective. So at what point do you feel like you have the right privacy engineering team, either sort of an ad hoc team or a central team? So what skills make for a more complete privacy engineering effort conversation? Ellen, over to you. Um, sure. Um, so we have a, a central team. So we have, um, so privacy engineering crew sits within the security org, and then we work very collaboratively with privacy legal, part of the legal org, of course. Um, that said, um, it's, it's constantly a balance of what are we driving ourselves versus what is the requirement? We're really partnering with other teams and, and they're actually doing the work of implementing. Um, I'd say that one approach that we've often found effective is um, we identify the risks. And if it's uh, complex to identify the remediation, perhaps we are really digging into what that looks like, coming up with a playbook, um, working with teams to drive remediations in a, a couple specific ways ourselves, and then really handing this off more now that we have an established model, right? So we still partner very closely with other folks when they are doing implementation of privacy requirements, of course, validating that they've effectively met the requirements, um, but really taking on a lot of the burden where we can, just given competing priorities. Um, in terms of skill sets, I'd say back to the, the earlier discussion, I think that having the folks who can really dive into the privacy analysis and come up with the requirements and identify the risks, um, that that's really what we're looking for more, more on our kind of consultative side of the team, privacy engineering services. Um, we found that in terms of the software engineering uh, 
side of the, the house, we don't necessarily need them to have as robust privacy skill sets. We do look for somebody with some background in privacy and security, but really they partner quite well together to build that tooling and and, and dig into the data and identify the risks. So, um, so we really look for a variety of skills. I'd say it was tougher earlier on with the team when you only have two people and you're trying to find people who have that real breadth of knowledge. It does get easier as you build out the team and are able to then instead look to fill specific gaps you have and can really look for somebody with depth in a certain area instead of trying to help fix all the problems. <laughs> That's great. And I think especially at a company like Cruise, you have to be nimble because it still kind of functions as a, as a scrappy small company. So I, I'm, I'm seeing sort of that ingenuity reflecting your answer. Aaron, over to you. Like, how do you make sure that you have the right skills at the table in the privacy engineering conversation? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really understanding the skills that already exist. So we have a central privacy team, but we also have distributed privacy teams, including engineering capabilities in, in business units as well. So my team is kind of a central, um, we look at it, uh, I've kind of redone the hub and spoke model where I say my team is really a lot of those spokes that provide that translation between kind of the legal guidance and the uh, the more what the engineers actually need. Um, and there's a couple of questions in the chat around how do you interact with, uh, with attorneys? Well, I tend to see the attorneys as providing the, the analog kind of the, this is the, what do you need to do? But they're not down into kind of that digital realm of this is exactly how you need to do it, right? At the level to put into a JIRA story or, you know, something that an engineer can go and code. So some of those skills are really that being able to understand both sides, but I think also really being good at building relationships um, because we are a function where people can be like, yeah, I don't need to go and use you, right? There, there are, a, you're a, you know, you're optional. Um, and I named one of the parts of my team actually enablement because I'm like, we're here to help you. We're here to actually, if you've got a problem where there's a privacy blocker or something, you'll say, well, we've got this big risk. We're told we can't do it. How do we enable you to kind of get over that hurdle? So I think the skills we're looking for are really kind of that. I don't want people who are going to sit in a back room and just code. I need people who are going to get out there and say, hey, this is some of the great stuff we're doing or we can do. This is how we can help you. So that's the team that I'm trying to build is one where people want to come to us because I don't really have that big stick, right? I'm not the legal team. Uh, my team, we need to find people who want to work with us. So that's a big piece of it. it's got to have the skills. And I think Ellen kind of covered that. But it's also people, I want to hire people that I want to work with, right? And other people want to work with. Because I think that's the key to success when you're you're starting out to kind of build this function. Great. And I have a separate question coming up on the legal side. So we kind of will dig into that in a few minutes. But Pramod, over to you in terms of the composition of the privacy and skill set. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of what Ellen and Aaron shared makes sense. I'll just add on that, right? So three core functional skills that I look for. Uh, privacy domain expertise, which is obviously a good understanding of privacy regulations, privacy considerations. Second is program management. In a privacy law, you're always organizing diverse groups of people to, to get to alignment. So having some program management skills is important. And finally, privacy sits at the core of data. So having a technical understanding of how data is processed is the third dimension of skills that you'd, you'd look for. And if we uh, connect that back to what I was previously talking about, right, which is your advisory privacy role versus your engineer privacy role, it's just going to be a balance of these skills that you're going to be looking for in a different way. One end of the spectrum would have more privacy and program skills. The other end would have more technical and privacy skills, if you will. But, but apart from these functional skills, there are two kind of soft skills that I always look for in privacy. The first is the ability to deal with ambiguity. Uh, there is a ton of ambiguity. Uh, if you look at privacy regulations, they are frameworks. They need to be interpreted. They need to be applied. And then you need to understand uh, how to uh, comply. Uh, and on the product side, you're always working on the cutting edge of what the organization wants because people are coming to you hopefully early on in the life cycle of product development, uh, technology development. So there's a lot of ambiguity to cut through and anybody who has the ability to cut through that ambiguity will do really well in a privacy function. And finally, communication skills. You're working with engineers and product folks on one side, you're working with legal folks on the other, with marketing on the other side, with sales and account teams. Uh, so, so you're working with a very diverse set of uh, stakeholders and you're communicating concepts that are alien to those groups of people. So strong communication skills is the other thing that I would look for for anybody on my privacy engineering team. Hey, thank you. Mira, over to you. 
Yeah, um, building on kind of what everybody's touched on. Um, at Uber, we have a, a centralized uh, privacy team wherein we have um, really kind of four core functions. Um, the the privacy engineers who who build the the deletion function, our DSR function, our consents tool. Um, we have uh, a, a core dedicated set of data analysts who um, run metrics for us, gain insights, um, both about our internal, the success of our internal tools, but also where we need to be building more, um, which I think is a very important function. Um, we have a program management to help us um, with some of our, our privacy initiatives, privacy programs, or technical privacy review processes. And then we also have this core team of the privacy architects um, where we really um, serve that kind of spoke purpose of, of interfacing with the various other stakeholders, being that conduit with legal, with the other engineering teams, and also helping do outreach to build um, a more federated privacy champions program. So we're all only a handful of individuals and we have, uh, you know, a endless need for, for kind of more privacy resources or privacy advocates. So we're, um, actively trying to build uh, privacy champions in other orgs, individuals that can serve as that resource within their team as kind of the first line of here's what to do, here are the right, you know, here are the privacy um, considerations that we should build for um, and have those individuals um, already helping to, to shape system design. So, and, and remind teams that they need to come to technical privacy um, or go through a PIA when needed. Um, Cause often there's so much happening that we're unable to, to chase them down and the business is working so fast that, um, you know, privacy is sometimes a, a secondary thought. So, great, thank you. So, I want to start taking Q and A questions from the audience, and I'll start combining some of these questions because we simply won't have enough time to ask each question individually. So, as promised, let's touch upon the legal function. A two-part question: How do you interact with legal, and how do you make the case for privacy engineering as a distinct function? Because too many people are going to see privacy as purely a legal matter, just as security is often thought of as incident response. Neither is true. So how do you, A, Mira, in, interact with the legal team? What models do you have in mind? And second, how do you make the case that privacy engineering should be supported and funded as a distinct discipline from the privacy legal team? They're great questions. Um, on the for the initial question in terms of um, building that relationship with legal, um, I work very closely not only with um, legal counsel, but um, uh, I have a counterpart on the legal team who is um, we're kind of each other's right hand. Um, he runs all kind of legal program side of things, and and we partner together on um, kind of every initiative that comes through. Uh, so, so having, having kind of at least one dedicated regular meeting with an individual on the legal team, I think is, is really important. Um, we also have a forum, um, where we bring in stakeholders, for example, um, we have a, a, a team dedicated to looking at, um, at looking at our deletion, uh, deletion solution, deletion backlog, um, and, and issues we want to tackle. So we bring in related stakeholders from legal, privacy architecture, engineers, and we get everybody in the same room. I think so having some some sort of regular touch point um, in order to continue to, to keep channels of communication open, it's so easy for, for silos to, to develop. So having regular touch points is important. Um, in terms of differentiating the need for technical privacy from a legal program, um, I think I think it's absolutely imperative that that they are distinct. I think um, a lot of times when people think of of uh, privacy or they think of privacy reviews, they're thinking of um, PIAs or just the the general legal review, which might look at approve. You know, it might grant approval for a specific. Um, feature being built for a specific use case, but it's not going to get into the nuance of what data is being collected and what are maybe downstream effects of that data collection are, um, is that data be, being handled appropriately? Is the chosen repository, storage repository, uh, does it support what would be needed for encryption at rest? And, and it's kind of those kind of technical implementation um, that, that we would want to see um, well, on the legal side, we're not going to get that. Um, so having a distinct technical privacy 
review process and and team that sits separately from that um, is is important. Um, additionally, it's not going to be the legal team that's going to work with the engineers to re-architect a systems design. It it's, needs somebody that has um, the understanding of the privacy requirements, but that can also speak engineering. So I think that's that's absolutely a different function. Absolutely. So upskilling is important across the board. From all over to you. I think you're mute, Pramod. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think a couple of things with the legal team. The first is there is a fundamental uh, alignment between a privacy engineering team and a legal team in terms of what the outcomes they want to achieve is. And that is their enablers to the business. Every privacy legal person I've spoken to uh, has wanted not to say no and wants to enable the business to achieve their outcomes. And that's exactly what privacy engineering teams' uh, uh, goals should be as well. We are enablers here, we are not blockers. So uh, when, when, when a new relationship with the privacy legal team is being established, I think underpinning this particular goal is a good way to kind of build a relationship on. The second and kind of counter to this, uh, I always uh, establish relationships with the legal team to have some healthy tension between the two. If you really think about it, legal teams are talking about the risk, and uh, I'd expect them to be a little bit on the conservative side. And privacy engineering teams, as as key representatives of the product and engineering function, uh, would be on the more aggressive side in terms of, hey, can we do it this way as well? And that healthy tension between those two groups is really important to kind of land in a sweet spot in 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 in, in privacy, where privacy is a lot about judgment, it's a lot about interpretation, it's a lot about understanding frameworks. So. Uh, Think about building that, that that trust relationship up in terms of what your goal is, but then also encouraging that healthy tension with the legal teams. Um, I'd say those are the top two takeaways in terms of working with legal. Great. Aaron, and uh, just a twist to the question for Aaron and Ellen here. Uh, oftentimes, privacy engineers overly depend upon legal by saying that do it or legal is going to like block us. So you use legal as a club to get other people with. And in some other cases, they see the legal team as a blocker saying, oh my goodness, the legal team's guidance is too high level. So it's not just about legal and the rest of the company. It's about how privacy engineers use legal and their mm -hmm. that relationship. Really. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about them, both of you, but Aaron first. Yeah, one of the things that we've done is to try and uh, create some combined governance processes. So, for example, we all have to deal with a new law comes out, right? And there's a legal interpretation of that law. How does that apply to the organization? What we've done is to build a parallel process where we do a, we've agreed on a consistent schema of how we think about new laws. And then we do an engineering review of the law at the same time that they're doing the legal review. And then we compare notes and say, okay, well, you, we've got this consideration here. We actually, this is actually a very significant engineering lift. You know, you may not have seen that because you don't, I think, mirror some of the stuff you were saying. They may not have seen some of the architecture needs to change to uh, to make that work. So that's where, uh, and I think I, I like kind of what you're saying, Pramod, with kind of the, uh, uh, the tension between the two sides. And I think we can still have that tension, but it's, it's establishing kind of that consistent way so you're not talking past each other. I think that's one of the major problems I've seen where this doesn't work is you're not just not speaking the same language to the point that you you can be arguing and be actually in agreement or probably even worse, the other way around where you think you're in agreement and then you go off and do different things. And that's where the problems come in later on. So I think it's getting the, at least establishing that baseline that you can say, we're gonna work on these problems together, even if we're coming at it from different angles. Um, that's what I've seen as being pretty critical to success. Awesome. And we have an amazing question coming up, but not before I ask Ellen for her point on this topic. Sure. Yeah, I really like that point of jointly coming up with the approach to governance. And I, I we certainly collaborate very, very closely with the privacy legal team. We actually have stand ups a couple of times a week with them. Um, it's certainly there. We come with, you know, slightly different perspectives. And we also work to reach alignment amongst ourselves and then show up as this united front of a privacy team. And so, you know, we jointly have come up with what is the operating procedure around privacy requests that come in? Like what, what point does legal want to be looped in? Like we certainly are never trying to say, oh, well, we would approve, but we have to ask legal, right? We want to certainly come to the um, stakeholders with a clear response from the privacy team. Um, and so do all that coordination sort of on the back end. Um, to the point earlier too about, uh, that I think there's a question about like an attorney and how they can best provide sort of value to the privacy engineering side. I, there are so many new laws coming out all the time. I mean, I'm so grateful, appreciative 
of to our legal team that is constantly giving us updates about what's to come to help us better bring that into our planning. And um, I think that I, the engineers we work with and our team um, super appreciate knowing what's on the roadmap for, for next year, um, sort of from the legal perspective. So I think the more that attorneys can sort of bring um, that, that clarity of guidance when we're seeing like the news articles come by with all the different, the laws popping up, uh, the, the stronger that partnership I think can exist. Uh, that was great. And, and by the way, I hope people are taking notes because this is such a fun panel. I, I've learned so much in the last 40 minutes. We could go on for like hundred minutes more, but uh, the next question is my favorite one. I love when people get edgy with their questions. You know, I've told people for a long time that privacy is about improving trust, reputation, building a better relationship with the customer. And if you invest in that, you will hopefully have less regulatory fire drills to begin with, right? That's the promise. But Chad asks an excellent question. How do you prove that this is actually working? And I'm going to quote his question. Uh, there, we see little evidence that all this investment in data protection is creating a more trust. There's a lot to it than that, but I would love for this panel to weigh in. Ellen, I'll ask you first, how do you make the case on the one side that investing in privacy builds trust without any real systemic trust improvements over the last five years? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I'll caveat with we've had customers for about a year and a half now. <laughs> we've had public riders in our cars. So um, this is something that we are actively thinking about too. Um, how can we work to make sure that we are um, you know, getting regular um, updated feedback from customers on our approach to privacy. And so I'll circle back to something I said earlier in the in the discussion. I think being able to partner with the research team is the most direct way you can get um, updated information on how customers feel. What And I think that from a privacy perspective, I have a couple key questions I'd be interested in, but I also defer a lot to the folks who are skilled in the research side of things to break down like, well, how do we really start fleshing out what customer trust looks like, right? If, if these are our top goals for privacy, how do we start to to, to get that information. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the, the major ways I would say. Um, I think that uh, it's not feedback from customers, but in terms of the way we're interacting with customers through data subject requests and things like that, um, certainly we want to make sure that we are uh, clearly communicating how customers can reach out to submit those requests. We're making sure that we're meeting our SLOs in terms of responding to those, right? And so while we're not getting direct feedback on that necessarily, um, you know, we have the impact numbers to, to show uh, that we've aligned with ex our expectations there. That's great, Aaron. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. I think one is that I, I look at trust as a series of kept promises. Right. So you, you promise you deliver, you promise you deliver. Right. So and there's a lot of promises that are being made that are outside of privacy that impact how trust uh, in an organization happens. Right. So we're, we're kind of we're part of that overall series of kept promises. Uh, but we need to be able to say, are we are we promising things we can actually deliver on? And how do we? And I think, Ellen, this is where you're going to with the DSAR process. How can we prove that when we said we were going to get this information, that's actually what we have and we've got it up to date and all the rest of it. So. I think that's part of it, but also if you remember back to kind of the theory around uh, Nissenbaum's model of contextual integrity, are you doing what people expect you to do? It's not just, I mean, I can say, hey, I'm gonna go and uh, brick your laptop, right? That I could promise that and I could deliver that, but that's not really what you want out of a laptop, right? So um, it's the, uh, are we actually understanding, I think what people want and then be able to say, this is in the context of the relationship, this is actually okay, or this is good. Uh, but one of the things we can actually measure a bit more directly, that translates into consent rates, uh, consent rates for marketing, consent rates for can you use my data for product improvement, some of those other things. So we do have some direct metrics, but I always come back to like, are we making promises we can keep? And are we even able to see whether we're making those, you know, able to do those things or not? Because if we don't know internally, how can people possibly trust us when we say, you know, we're, we're doing these things, just believe that we're doing them. Trust as a series of kept promises. That's a phenomenal sound, but I, I hope we use it for our LinkedIn conversation as we go forward. Pramod, over to you. Yeah, I really like that that promise uh, argument that Aaron makes, right? Um, at Amazon, one of the approaches um, uh, Amazon takes broadly, and I took within the advertising privacy team as well was, uh, to define a set of simple declarative statements that represent your promises. Uh, and then what you can do is measure each of your products, features, technology against those set of simple declarative statements 
uh, to make sure that you're on the right side of that trust equation. Uh, do those statements stay uh, static for a long period of time? No, they evolve as, as every business does and as every uh, product changes and as regulations evolve, um, all of those statements change, but then it at least becomes a conscious decision to change that statement into something new where, where you're applying thought, you're applying uh, consideration from a customer standpoint, the regulatory standpoint and the business standpoint. So I think, um, there's there's no easy answer to this, right? It's super hard to empathy and measure trust. So I think creating proxies like that through simple statements, through high level metrics that you can use, or or even surveys that you can run. And, and it's also true that customer behavior means they're gonna reach out to you when they're unhappy, not when they're happy to tell you that their their trust has been retained or or built. So uh, look for those negative signals where you have those negative signals and and try and identify those trends. Your customer service. Uh, counterparts are going to be your friends there in terms of getting a pulse of uh, what what conversations are that customers are having. So these are some of the soft avenues that you could collect some data through and put together an overall trust model. Awesome, Mira, over to you, and then we're going to move towards the last couple of questions. Absolutely, and I think it's a great question. How do you measure something that's unquantifiable? Um, but uh, on on our end, where we're trying to tackle it, both from the qualitative and from the quantitative perspectives, um, on the qualitative side, we're we're leveraging um, surveys and and trying to get that um, a, a pulse of sentiment. Um, you know, with the trust of our customers, with their their level of of contentment, with their engagement, uh, excuse me, uh, just this, yeah, the sentiment behind it. And then on the qual uh, the quantitative side is where we're looking at things like engagement, engagement particularly with our um, outward facing, externally facing privacy tools um, within our our privacy center on our app. You have various features. Um, you can see um, view as view as driver or view as rider from the the driver app. So there are the we've we've created our 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 product team has partnered with the privacy team and built um, several features to enable um, viewers users to see what. The, their counterpart can see of theirs. So we're trying to be as open and transparent about what data we have of theirs is visible to another party, how we're using their data. Um, and then with each launch of, of new products, our, our data analysts are tracking and measuring the engagement with these new features, with these products. And then um, to Pramod's point, the um, the kind of the negative uh, the negative signals um, that that may or may not be correlated with that. I'm not saying causation, but um, if for if there is a correlation with uh, DSAR requests or with um, account deletion requests that may or may not um, happen in conjunction with or shortly after um, the launch of a new product. So we're measuring that regularly um, to try to gauge that um, that unquantifiable. Uh, trust. Thank you, Mira. So I want to, this might be the last question and I add another one if time permits, but one of my favorite TV series is Law and Order, where they take something that happened in real life and make an episode of it. And they make the claim that any resemblance to people dead or alive is coincidental. So privacy is kind of like that, where stuff that happens that gets discussed impacts us on a daily basis and we have to sort of apply it to our jobs. So this might be a bit of a trick question, so I'm happy to sort of like move around a bit if people need more time to think. But what is something that is being discussed in contemporary pop culture, media, movies, sports, whatever, that makes you think about, oh my goodness, this has so much to do with privacy. I would love to, and the reason I'm asking this question is because we don't work in a detached environment. Like what we do as privacy engineers is very connected to real world, real people, real consequences. So what out there fascinates you the most right now when it comes to our profession? So Mia, you want to go first? I mean, I think AI takes the cake and just how um, on, on all fronts, our personal data has already been ingested. Anything that we've put out there through any of the social media platforms, anything that's on the web um, already exists in some um, big library somewhere. And, and what are the impacts of that? And what are the impacts of not being able to request a uh, right to a rasher for, of an, an AI system? So. And that's an excellent point. Like during our cloud migration as an industry back in the day, we kept a lot of that data. We just thought it'd be more efficient and cheaper. And so we essentially kicked the can down the road and we're paying for it now. AI is a whole different level of complexity and potency. So Mira makes an excellent point. Pramod, over to you. 
Yeah, that's a tough one. I think um, the, the the one thing I'll call out is the free internet, right? We've seen in the last few years, the free internet is becoming less free. You're, you're starting to see a lot more paywall and privacy is sitting at uh, at least one edge of that, if not at the center of that. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, adaptation that's happening right now in business models. A lot of uh, changes coming up as a result of that, that, that we should be aware of and how that back funnels into your data practices internally is going to become very, very critical. I think. Um, it, it is a balance again, uh, between having, when you say something's for free, it really isn't for free. You're, you're, you're giving something away and, uh, and what we're giving away so far is data, right? And now when you start to have embargoes on data and what it can be used for and how it can be used for how long, et cetera, you're, you're going to lose that trade-off soon enough given the way regulations are going. So I think keeping an eye out for that is going to be super important in, in terms of how your data privacy program should be. Great. And there's an education component of this. So Pramod makes an excellent argument. Sometimes people get so self-righteous that they forget the fact that not everybody lives and breathes data the way we do. So stepping back and bringing people to you so you can take them where you think they need to be is pretty critical. So Pramod makes that point excellently. Something Pramod taught me in my career back in the day. So Aaron, over to you. I would say almost every episode of Black Mirror uh, is, uh, uh, particularly uh, if you remember the episode, I think it was from this season of Joan is Awful, where uh, they use her AI recreated likeness and uh, she goes into her lawyer and says, how did this happen? And they pull out the contract. She's like, you signed the contract. Did you read the contract? Uh, there's so much of this that I think, not that my roadmap is based on Black Mirror, but uh, I think that there's a lot of this where uh, um, you can look at some of the almost taken to extremes. Um, I think of some of the stuff we're seeing today and be like, ha, huh, you know, that that is that kind of slippery slope argument. Let's get ahead of some of these things before we end up in those kind of scenarios. Great, Ellen? Yeah, what an interesting question. I think that, um, so I'm gonna level up from uh, like self-driving cars specifically, but I think there's this conversation about um, automation and removing individuals from processes where there have always been individuals involved. And I think that it leads to such interesting privacy challenges about how to create a good user experience and provide the support that customers need um, in a way that's privacy enhancing. And there are interactions where previously somebody might have just told an individual certain information about themselves. And now this data is being collected by a machine, right? And so um, trying to figure out how to navigate that new world where there is so much less human interaction in certain types of services. Um, and what are we doing with that data that we're now collecting in an entirely new way? Awesome. And we may not have time for everybody to weigh in on the next questions. I'm going to just put a little blurb for the community and then ask Ellen one more question. So this webcast, this podcast is about the larger privacy engineering community. We are trying to build here at Provado. So Hernando is going to post a link. We want people to join because we have always complained about not having enough engineers, not having enough privacy specialists, and we need to start somewhere to build the community out. We know there's people out there with great ideas, amazing records. So please join the community. You could be on the panel the next time, but it is about growing the discipline and growing the people who can succeed in it. Because to Aaron's point, we cannot keep our promises. We cannot build trust unless we work together. So please join the community and add your voice to it. Uh, one more question, and we'll see how much we can do before the time runs out. How do you make the case for where privacy engineering lives within the company? So if all of you can take a minute each, that'd be great. So where should this discipline live and how do you make the case for it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that uh, the model that we have for my team works very well for us because we are embedded in the engineering orgs um, planning and uh, the way that we work so closely with engineering teams to talk about all the competing priorities and make the case for the impact of the privacy work that we need to see done. Um, I feel like that is done much more seamlessly when you are part of that same organization. So um, it, we are fully embedded in their planning process, communicate very regularly throughout the quarters. And I, I think, and then I, I relatedly think that having the legal side of privacy and representation on that side is crucial to the kind of comprehensive approach that we're taking. Great. Thank you, Aaron. One minute for you, Aaron, on the same question. Yeah, I, I have an interesting, I have a dotted reporting line up through the chief data officer. So we're very tightly aligned with kind of a lot of those broader data governance efforts, which I think is helpful as well as kind of close alignment with the uh, the central privacy team too. So yeah, I think 
getting closer to the people who are trying to work on some of the same problems, but from a different way has been very helpful. Thank you, and Pramod? Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, staying close to product and engineering is my is my preference. That's where the data is. That's the biggest cohort of people within an organization. So creating a privacy-centric culture becomes easier. Uh, the next preferred approach would be to sit close to the CISO uh, organization or the security organization, because that brings up some synergies in terms of uh, uh, leveraging tools, partnering on, on, on some combined efforts in terms of advisory, et cetera. There's, there's lots of similarities there. And my least preferred approach is for privacy engineering to sit inside of legal organizations. Thank you, Ron, Mira. Um, in in our role, or in technical privacy at Uber, we've sat both under legal and now we sit within an eng org, but have always been tethered um, to the within part of engineering security. Um, and I felt feel that is very beneficial because whether under legal or now. Um, within engineering, um, we have the weight of, of NGSEC. We have that security engineering uh, name behind us, which privacy is, you know, 10 years behind what security was. So um, having that weight when we go to the table to negotiate with engineers to try to implement changes for us um, goes a little further. We're seen as a partner versus just a, a, a roadblock or a compliance check that, that's coming and asking something from them. Thank you, Mira. That was great. So I'm going to close this panel out. This was an amazing panel, and I hope people who attended take away some key insights. A, nobody has all the answers. We all face the same challenges. Hopefully, this discussion and the back and forth and the responses created awareness as to how we can go about it. But we would rather keep this conversation going, have the community sort of teach itself over and over again, and make this discipline better. Because remember, our companies may not always appreciate it in the beginning, but they need privacy engineering. And you guys can all serve as the connecting tissue, not just within the company, like Mira said, but also between your company and the larger community. Because at the end of the day, without our customers, without our users, without their data, we are nothing. So remembering that there's a human being at the end of the data is also pretty critical. So with that being said, I'll bring this session to a close. See you all in the community and see you at the next webcast as well. Thank you, Mira, Pramod, Aaron, and Ellen for joining us this morning. Thank you for Devesh and Hernando for organizing this. And we will see you next time. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thank you.